Okay, thank you. It's it's great to be here. And and again, as someone else said, I wish I it would have been possible to be there in in LA on the campus of uh, UCLA. And but unfortunately, uh, times are different now. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm sure we have people in all continents. And uh, so this is going to be a, a, a talk quite different from the ones that uh, at least I have uh, uh, watched and, and heard the last three days. Uh, most of it was, if not all, on continuous time mean field games. This one is going to be on discrete time mean field games. Maybe this is the only one in the in this workshop on discrete time problems. And uh, not much has been done actually on the discrete time uh, front. And and we uh, with my colleague at Illinois, Maxim Raginsky, and uh, <clears throat> who was uh, Naji Saldi, was a postdoc with us at the time. And, uh, and now he is at uh, Erzien University at the, in Istanbul, Turkey. And so we uh, decided to look at the discrete time mean field games and, uh, and develop a general theory. And, and, this, and I'll share uh, essential different aspects of that theory that we have developed. So the, uh, our motivation is, and, and my motivation all along in looking at mean field games, has been driven by sort of an agony I had in trying to obtain um, Nash equilibria, also Stackelberg equilibria in some sense, but I'll not be talking about that, in uh, stochastic non-zero sum dynamic games when players do not share their information, and which is what we would call an asymmetric information. And, and these uh, games, uh, when you have a finite number of players, you have a finite population, uh, are extremely challenging. So, so these are, you have a population of agents who are interacting uh, with each other and, uh, and their uh, cost functions or utility functions uh, are dependent on the actions of at least some of the other agents, but they don't have access to the information those agents have. So the, the coupling, so you have coupling between the agents and through the state dynamics, uh, as well as through the cost function. And, uh, and there are papers which have looked at uh, cases where the coupling is only through the cost functions. And so each agent may have its own dynamics, but here we are going to look at problems where you have coupling through both. So these problems are extremely difficult when you formulate them, uh, even in the even even in the linear quadratic framework, uh, when you have a finite number of players. In some cases, even if you have two players, uh, the theory is not there, and and for a good reason. Uh, one is uh, there is strategic interaction between the players. So during the play of the game, in order to act optimally to what the other players have done, a player has not in minimizing his or her cost function, has to anticipate or has to guess what the other player's information uh, has been. And, and this is what we call the, uh, the iterative second guessing. In, in, in general, in improving existence of solutions to, or Nash equilibria to games, to dynamic games, what you do is, is you uh, optimize the cost function of a player uh, given arbitrary sort of policies of the other players. So that will give you a reaction function for that player. And then you compute it for all players and see whether there is a, a fixed point. But uh, uh, for uh, 
games, stochastic games, where you have asymmetric information, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to obtain these reaction functions uh, because uh, the players do not have access to all the information based on which the policies of the other players have done. Even in linear quadratic games, the second guessing could lead to an infinite recursion, which uh, even for finite dimensional problems, you could end up with infinite dimensional in the limit uh, uh, solutions. Now, the, uh, the mean field game approach actually provides a way out of this, this agony, what I would call, or, or this uh, difficulty. And uh, what you do is, is in the limit, as uh, the number of players go to infinity, and if the interaction is in a particular way through the mean field term, then the, what, other, what information the other players have access to becomes kind of irrelevant. And and everything everything is summarized in the in the mean field uh, term and in the distribution of that mean field term and uh, and and so therefore this simplifies the problem uh, uh, a lot but still there are lots of technical details and then uh, one would use that solution to go back and obtain uh, a solution to an n player game. And use it for the uh, for the n player game as a solution when n is sufficiently large. So, so most of the theory uh, that I'm going to talk about here uh, will take that route. Uh, given an n player game, uh, a general class of n player games, you go to the mean field limit, obtain the solution, and then see to what extent that solution provides an approximate Nash equilibrium for a finite, but still a high population game. So there are, there are four recent papers that this talk is based on, and, and you can find the details, the technical details in those papers. Uh, the first two have already appeared, so you can access them. Uh, the third one uh, is on uh, risk sensitive uh, discrete time uh, games, the mean field equilibria, and, and that will appear in the mathematics and operations research, but has not appeared yet. Maybe it has while we are talking uh, here. And, uh, but I will, uh, later in the slides, I'll have an archive link to that so that you'll be able to access it. And then the, the last one is on partially observed discrete time with sensitive games. So the, uh, so this is a, what I view as a complete package, actually, uh, as, as we'll see uh, shortly, uh, on discrete time mean field games and, and as, as a, a general framework as, as possible, that we think. So here's the outline of the talk after this uh, long uh, introduction. Uh, I'll first, it consists of three parts. And uh, all these three parts at a very higher level follow the same sort of an approach. As I indicated, our, our interest is in obtaining a solution to finite agent, finite population games, and then, but this is impossible to do. So we go to the mean field game problem and then justify it, of course, that it's an appropriate uh, limit of the finite game problem as n, the number of players, uh, go to, to infinity. And then, and then showing the existence of mean field equilibrium and then coming back and showing that uh, this is an approximate Nash equilibrium. In the case of fully observed uh, discrete time mean field games, uh, we're looking for Markov Nash equilibrium. I'll define that. And, uh, and I say fully observed, but what fully observed means that each player has access to its to own state, local state, I may call it, and, uh, and, and not uh, players do not share the, the values of their states. Fully observed in the sense that, that there is no noise in the observation of the state by each player. 
Now in the in the second part, the this is relaxed. There is partial observation again by each player on his or her state, and and we follow the the same sort of an approach. Uh, uh, go to the mean field limit, obtain existence of solutions. Uh, unfortunately, with the kind of generality we have, we don't have uniqueness, and it's almost impossible to obtain uniqueness because we use Calcutta's uh, fixed point theorems. And uh, and then they're going down to and showing the existence of approximate Nash equilibrium. And then the part three will will talk about the risk sensitive. Uh, mean field games and the counterparts of these results in the very sense of as I'll not be able to cover all the technical details will go but but the slides uh, will will be linked to the to the title after the talk I'll send it uh, and uh, send them and so you'll be able to see the details so fully observed a uh, discrete time mean field game model so let me just introduce the, the this is a Discrete time uh, problem, as I indicated, you have n uh, agents or n players, and this is the dynamics of the of the ith agent, and uh, the n superscript n means that there are n agents or n players in the game. So it's uh, the dynamics is uh, you can view this as the transition from uh, state action and then the uh, the empirical distribution of the state configuration which involves other players and some noise in the in the system so it's a it's a mapping from here at time t to the next state and, and you can have a have a, a probability sort of transition uh, the the vi's are iid sequences and and they have the same distribution across all players and uh, for all and and for all i. Now the uh, the model is quite general in the sense that the state belongs to a a, a, a space uh, X, which is a general Polish space, and uh, and the actions of the players a i is the action of the i player in the n player game. It's a valued where a is also a Polish space. This is the control variable, and and e, as I indicated, is the empirical distribution of the state configuration, which is well known to this to this community, and and it's an element of the the uh, space of all probability distributions on X, and uh, and the and the goal is for agent I to select its actions based on the information, which I'll uh, clarify shortly, to minimize a functional given in terms, and this will be an infinite horizon problem, given in terms of a one-stage cost function, which depends, again, uh, on the state uh, of that particular player. And note that C is not indexed by I. And uh, so, so the cost is symmetric across all players, but, but uh, each C depends on the action of that player the A and the, the, the belongs to A and also uh, this uh, empirical distribution. Okay, so you can have special cases where uh, this may not involve this uh, empirical uh, distribution and only the cost function. So the coupling would be through the cost function or the other way around. But but we consider the most most general case. So what what are the control policies in this problem? The control policies are that the, uh, uh, at time t, uh, the entire history, but the entire history meaning that the state, individual state of that particular player, and then the action that, that of that particular player, and then the distribution of the, this empirical distribution uh, up to time t, and then the, and this is, this is what happens, this is the most, this is from zero to uh, t minus one, uh, actually, but it's it says t because uh, we start at zero, and uh, and then also the current uh, state of that player and the uh, and p of x. The policy is a stochastic kernel. We are allowing for mixed uh, uh, distributions, 
uh, for each player uh, in this in this generality. It's a it's a stochastic con uh, kernel on A given eight sub D, and and we'll be interested in Markov policies and and we can show that there is no loss of generality for this problem, uh, where it's um, uh, pi sub t is a, is a Markov kernel on A given x. And I'm going to denote the set of all policies for a particular agent I uh, in this uh, is by pi sub I and the Markov policies, set of Markov policies with appropriate topologies, uh, m sub I, and the and and the, the product of all uh, these uh, spaces over all agents uh, will be with both both letter pi and and m. So uh, a special class of stochastic non-zero sum games, and I'll come back to th this later on also uh, when we I state the assumptions that under which existence will be. Uh, holds, and then those assumptions will lead to simpler assumptions for specific classes of problems. So, so here, this is uh, one where, uh, let's say that the x is uh, just a, takes values on the on the real line. It's one dimensional in this case. It's a very special case, and the uh, and the state dynamics is written in this form. And note that the uh, X J N is the uh, these are the uh, um, states of the other players, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, and this you have summation from one to n, and and you have the averaging with respect to n. If this is linear, for example, then this would be the averaging of this term, and then that would be the expected value of x in the limit as n goes to infinity. And then there is the, the additional term. This is the noise term, which is multiplied by uh, another uh, sort of uh, term, which depends on the i player's uh, state as well as the i player's action, but not the j player. So the, the x sub j does not enter here. So, so this is one class of problems, one very special class of problems for which we can specialize our results. And the and the vi since this is all on on uh, the real line we can take the the v sub i ends as the Gaussian random variables a sequence of i i d the one stage cost function for the generic agent i can be described in this form also uh, in that case and and you take the average uh, of these terms where each one depends on a, there is a coupling with x sub j. Okay, so this would be a very special case. Now, the cost functions that we take, these are discounted costs. Uh, discounted, uh, you discount uh, uh, in time. The beta is a parameter uh, uh, between zero and one. And the uh, expected value of this, given any policy, uh, n tuple by, by all n players, uh, is, the, is the cost. To, uh, to player I. And uh, the Nash equilibrium, very quickly, and, and this community definitely uh, is very much familiar with this, is, the, uh, is, is one where it's a player by a player optimality in this generality. And so there are two challenges, as I indicated. Uh, almost the centralized nature of the information structure of the problem creates a problem. And the curse of dimensionality, the solution of the problem is intractable when the numbers or states and actions and our agents are large. Okay, that's why we go to the uh, mean field. We take the mean field approach. The approximate, so as I indicated, that we, we look for approximate uh, Nash equilibria. And uh, uh, so first of all, the Markov Nash equilibrium is defined in exactly the same way where uh, now you restrict yourself to Markov policies. And as I indicated, this is no loss of generality we show in the paper. And then the, and then the epsilon Markov Nash equilibrium is, is one where this is when we go from the mean field uh, game solution to the actual uh, template games and see to what extent it provides a solution. Definitely, it's not going to be 
an exact Nash equilibrium, uh, we are going to lose something. The question is, how much can you lose? And given an epsilon, can you find n sufficient to large such that this inequality will hold? So the main steps in the, the I'll give a highlights. I will not go uh, be able to go into the uh, details of the technical proofs. So we have a, a, a proof of existence of epsilon Markov Nash equilibria for games with sufficient many agents. So that's the bottom line of that. And this is the first paper which I, which I listed. So we first consider a mean field game that arises in the infinite population limit. We prove the existence of mean field equilibrium for this limiting mean field game. And then we show that the mean field equilibrium is an approximate Markov Nash equilibrium for the original game. Then we have a sufficiently large number of players. There is, a, there is quite scant literature on, the, on a discrete time games. Of course, in continuous time mean field games, there is a lot of work that has been uh, done. And here are a few references. More can be found in, that, in the paper. So, so the, the limiting mean field game, what does that look like? Uh, we have essentially, we have a, a generic agent, a single agent, who is facing uh, uh, is the mass uh, with certain behavioral pattern, and that's the state measure flow uh, uh, mu. You know that this is on the probability space of x to uh, uh, all the way to infinity. So, given mu, a generic agent has this following state dynamics in the limit and uh, with an action variable A. And again, the same information structure, uh, this time it's just a, a history space is given compatible with the earlier one. And then we are looking again for a stochastic uh, kernel on a given, given G. And, and you know, the set of all possible policies by pi, no, no N in this case, because this is for the infinite Population. And then we have Markov definition of Markov policies likewise. So, what's a mean field equilibrium? A policy is, is pi star is optimal for mu. So, so you fix mu, and uh, this is the uh, state uh, measure. And, uh, uh, and, and then you solve with respect to, the, uh, to pi. That's a single generic agent optimal control problem. So this is stochastic control problem. Uh, let me just introduce the notation script M to be the set of uh, all distributions or measures uh, such with mu sub zero fixed at time zero, let's say. So, so you uh, obtain a given mu, obtain the, uh, a pi, uh, which is optimal, against mu. Let's denote the set of all such uh, uh, optimal solutions corresponding to mu by uh, phi of mu. Now, we have to look uh, for consistency that is uh, given, a, given a policy for a particular agent. Uh, we take uh, the distribution on the state x and then Transit it to the next stage, which is mu two plus one. So this is another fundamental equation, and uh, and and let's denote uh, for each pi uh, the uh, uh, the set of all such uh, mu's uh, by lambda, and uh, so that's a mapping. It's not set valued because it's uh, there is a single equation which determines it. And the, and the mu is uh, uh, going to belong to lambda here. So, so a mean field equilibrium is one where you have pi will have to belong to this. So it has to be optimal against mu. And mu has to be consistent with pi. So you have equality here. And this is a, a pi belongs to this. So what one would normally do is in, in solving uh, for this. So we're looking for a fixed point. In other words, for, for a pi star and mu star, 
which satisfy both of these, okay, or pi and mu. Now, you could, uh, one could uh, say, uh, substitute this mu into this here, and then have a composite uh, mapping, phi lambda, uh, composite lambda, from the space where phi belongs to the space where, to the set of all subsets of, of the space where phi belongs. Okay, so that's, one would be looking for a, a fixed point of this, but this is, turns out to be not a, a good uh, relationship to work with because there isn't a very nice topology on the space of Markov policies. So, I, uh, there is uh, some notation which uh, I will have to introduce here, but, but essentially, we are, this is just to make the point that we are, uh, we look into problems where C is both bounded as well as unbounded. And when C is unbounded, then we have to uh, uh, define the norm uh, in, a, in a slightly different way where we introduce a WX, which is larger than or equal to one plus the metric. This is DX is the metric for X space. Uh, distance between x and x zero to the power of p, and uh, uh, and then the we have the uh, the set of all uh, policy uh, all distributions over x uh, will have to satisfy this, and uh, of course if w is equal to one, which is the case when c is bounded, then this simplifies a lot. So, so these are the uh, a set of assumptions, and under these assumptions, it turns out that we can prove existence of a solution, a mean field equilibrium. The cost function C is continuous. A has to be compact and X locally compact. The stochastic kernel is weakly continuous. We have this condition, and uh, this takes care of the, if, if W is one, then it's a much simpler, uh, essentially boundedness on, on P. Uh, we have continuity uh, here of the integral of P and, uh, and also C satisfies, this is applies to the case when C is not bounded, it has a certain growth condition. And then the, with the discount factor and alpha and, and gamma, we have uh, to have this condition, the product has to be less than one, okay? So for this special case, which I had introduced earlier, uh, these assumptions, uh, this assumption one uh, holds whenever these conditions hold. This is, remember that this is a, a scalar problem, actually. It is compact, G continues, F bounded and continues. The G squared uh, behaves like, uh, does not grow faster than X squared and so on. This is what multiplies the noise though. And, and, and several other conditions. Uh, so under this assumption, the mean field game admits a mean field equilibrium. So that's the, that's the first basic result. So what it involves, I will not go into the details. As I indicated, you have to look at this as a pair. Uh, you look at the measure uh, of on the policy space as well as on the on the uh, on the state uh, space and the joint measure and then you uh, for each mu or new new at one that means this is this corresponds to the mu I had earlier and uh, you write down the dynamic programming equation. And then introduce, this is, uh, follows a technique that was uh, developed by, or first introduced by uh, Jovanovic and Rosenthal, uh, Journal of Monetary Economics in 88. You introduce a set valued mapping, and, and again, we, we have a fixed point equation which involves two relationships. So, so the first one is C nu, is uh, is essentially the the uh, update mechanism from the measure at time t to the measure at time t plus one, and then the the second set essentially says that uh, is the optimality set under this measure the set of x and a which satisfies the optimality equation 
uh, is uh, the probability of that is is one. Okay, so so you have these two, and uh, and and then I I'll go very fast over this. If if there is a fixed point of this gamma, which is which is which is this, then then that's a, that's a, a, a mean field equilibrium. Okay, so that's that's what we the first component of nu and then pi is a mean field equilibrium. This involves a disintegration of nu uh, uh, into a product uh, between the, the measure on x as well as a, a policy, uh, which is a which is a mixed policy given x. And uh, and then the the final piece is is to uh, for existence of a fixed point is to go to Calcutta's fixed point here. Okay, so that shows the the mean field equilibrium. Now the question is, as I pose, given a mean field equilibrium and an epsilon positive, does there exist an n which depends on epsilon such that for the n player game with n larger than or equal to Epsilon, if all players use the mean field equilibrium policy, they would be in epsilon Nash equilibrium. That is this. Okay, so, so this is what the all players are using this pi, which is the mean field equilibrium in this case. This is an n player game. And, uh, and the result is uh, yes, this is indeed the case. So I'll go, I, I will not go into the details uh, of this. And and essentially skip this part and and move on to the, to the second part. But as I said, I'll I'll share the slides with all of you. There are uh, various. There is a second set of assumptions under which this holds, and those assumptions for the special class boil down to to the to the three that I have here on this slide. So if these two assumptions hold, then for any uh, epsilon, there exists a positive integer. And such that for n larger than or equal to n epsilon, this policy is an epsilon mark of Nash equilibrium. Okay. So I uh, am going to skip this part and then talk a little bit in the remaining time on partially observed mean field games, just, just drawing the parallels. Uh, and uh, uh, so, what is a partially observed mean field game? Again, the the ith agent observes its state uh, partially only. Okay, so so this state equation is the same one that I had earlier, and now we have an additional equation, uh, which uh, this is the observation of the ith agent. So the ith agent cannot does not have access to its own state x i n but has access to it through, say, a noisy channel, which is also corrupted by other agents. The other agents also influence this channel. And then some other noise, WI, the VI and WR are IID sequences and they are independent of each other. And so Y is a capital Y valued observation variable, which is also a Polish space. The agent I selects its, again, uh, action based on its observations to minimize a discounted cost given in terms of this. It's the same type of a cost that we have. But now the, the difference here is that instead of X, now I have Y. Okay? So uh, the, uh, for the special case, uh, uh, again, the same sort of dynamics. This is all scalar. And, uh, and the measurement can be written in this form where WI is an additive noise and, uh, and the measurement channel is, is contributions coming in from the other states also. So you have coupling in this case, not only in the state equation, but also in the measurement equation, as well as in the cost function. So, uh, Again, we have uh, difficulty, uh, even even more difficulty in obtaining the Nash equilibria. And uh, the definition of Nash equilibrium or an epsilon Nash equilibrium is the same in this general uh, space. And, uh, and I'll uh, skip this. 
so uh, so what we have is essentially the mean field game for this problem is one where uh, a, a single generic agent is faced with a stochastic control problem where the state equation has, uh, uh, in addition to the standard state action and noise, also has the state measure flow of mu. And likewise, the, the Y also has that. So the generic agent will select its action based on its observation to minimize the discount, of course. And the control policies for the mean field game are given in this form. And uh, they are just mappings from the history of measurements and actions and, and the measurement at the last stage. And, and it's a stochastic kernel. And uh, so the mean field equilibrium first, as I did earlier, the, the, for a given mu, you find the, the set of all optimal pi's for the, an, an agent. And then, and then you do the transition uh, relationship between the uh, uh, mu at time t and mu at time t plus one, and then you look for a fixed point. Now the uh, and then the mean field equilibrium is would be that that fixed point. So we have a number of assumptions again on this. I'll uh, uh, these are just regularity assumptions, and and we think they are fairly. Uh, non-restrictive and uh, and for the special case uh, of the that scalar game those assumptions boil down to these and and which are again very reasonable uh, and our main uh, result again here is that the under assumption three the partially observed uh, uh, mean field game admits a mean field equilibrium now to establish this, uh, the approach, and again, I'll not go into the into the details of this, is to uh, uh, convert the original uh, partially observed control problem to a fully observed one, but on a lifted space of conditional distributions. And so, therefore, this is a, this is where the the main difficulty comes in. And uh, uh, so this is a, uh, a POM DP, uh, which we reduced to a fully observed one. And, and we can use the, the technique that, that I discussed uh, earlier. However, there, is a, there are several technical difficulties, and one of which is that uh, there is no, no uh, explicit analytical expression that describes the relationship between mu and eta, where, where eta is the corresponding mu in the, in the lifted space. And, and so that we, we, can, we can prove and use, uh, so, so let, me, let me, again, one can introduce an appropriate function C, set C and B, and then use the same approach in obtaining a fixed point, and then you're doing a disintegration, and then relating it to the original problem. So, um, uh, and then the next thing is once we have the mean field equilibrium, showing the existence of approximate Markov Nash equilibrium, and then that uh, the paper, the second paper that I have, uh, carries that out. Okay. So if assumptions three and four hold, so there is a, a set of, in the, in the fully observed case, we had assumptions one and two I had here, slightly uh, different versions of those. Then again, the, the mean field equilibrium can be used in an M-player game, and we have an, an uh, epsilon Nash equilibrium with partial observations, okay? And uh, so there, there are uh, so, sort of uh, some difficulties and, and like the, uh, the Markovian aspect, uh, pi itself is not necessarily Markovian. We turn it to a Markovian 
problem and then show that there is no loss of generality. So discrete time, uh, we sense the mean field gains in the, in the remaining time. I have about five minutes. Uh, uh, this is, uh, we have two papers on this. And, uh, and this one has an archive, you can access it. And this one, the second one, the, so this is the, uh, for risk sensitive uh, uh, mean field games with perfect state information for the players. Again, local, fully observed problem. And this one is partially observed problem. And then there is an, a, a much shorter version which was presented at the Decision and Control Conference uh, in Nice, France, in in December of 2019, and so in the proceedings you can access this. And if you cannot access, then I can send you copies of this. And uh, so uh, I'm going to just talk about briefly the partially observed uh, case here. The uh, other case is uh, can be uh, has to be handled differently. The fully observed because the assumptions are, are different. Uh, but let me just, uh, 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 just one or two points as to how uh, our approach to these problems are, at least the, the one in the partially observed case, not in the fully observed case. So you again have partial measurements and then the, the state I'm going to denote by S and, and there is a reason for this, where X is reserved for something else. And, uh, and again, the, uh, uh, the general framework is the same other than the cost function, which is a, which is a this is called the risk sensitive cost function. So you exponentiate an additive cost with some discounting beta T. And then the lambda is the risk factor. So, so again, one can introduce the, the Nash equilibria, epsilon Nash equilibria, and, and so on. There has been quite a bit of work in with sense the mean field gains, but mostly in the continuous time. And then I think the, the first paper that initiated this is uh, one that Tim Bean, who is a speaker here later on Friday, Huang Yang Su and, and I published in the transactions on up automatic control, and there are a few other ones. But there doesn't seem to uh, exist any one with the kind of generality that we have in, in these two papers. So, so the, the, the basic approach is that uh, you um, uh, convert the risk sensitive cost to uh, an equivalent game model where the cost can be written in an additive form, as in the risk neutral case. And in this model, this is a finite horizon problem. Uh, in this model, the time horizon, uh, in the original game, it was T, it becomes T plus one. And then one can use results from the earlier part, the second part I discussed, in order to do it with some uh, important adjustments. So here is the state. The state is the, the state of the game and the cost function up to time t minus one, the discounted cost. Okay, so this is your new state. If you, if you define this as a, as a new state and the new state dynamics and so on, then, then essentially you can convert this problem into a risk neutral one. Okay, so, so this would be the evolution of the state. And then you have the measurements also, which can be expressed in terms of X. Okay. Now I'm, I'm going to skip all the details. The slides will have all those details. Or oh, I should also mention that the C, the cost function, is a discontinuous one. It, for T less than or equal to capital T is zero. For T equal to T plus one, it's E to the lambda. Okay. So with, with this modification, then, then this becomes equivalent to a, a, a problem, to a risk neutral problem. The assumptions that were made there will have to be, uh, re, uh, we have to rethink what they would be in this context, but everything is, works out fine. And, uh, and we have both the mean field equilibrium 
and uh, and so I I will skip all this, and and basic result is that this is again the mean field equilibrium definition. Under some assumptions, the mean field game admits a mean field equilibrium, and uh, and the result follows from the earlier theorem three I had on the risk neutral version, but with and, and then using Calcutta's fixed point theorem and so on. And, uh, and then one can show that uh, there is an approximate Nash equilibrium. The mean field solution could be used as an, as an approximate Nash equilibrium for the original game. We have, to, we have to convert it back to the risk sensitive problem. And so, but everything, everything works fine. Now, this was on finite time. And it turns out that it's necessary to be able to have that kind of an, uh, in order to have that uh, uh, relationship between a risk neutral problem and a risk sensitive problem. And, uh, but, but that's not a, 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 doesn't, as far as approximation goes, does not create any problems because one can show that if you are given any epsilon, we can always choose a T, which satisfies the bound like this. And then if we let N epsilon over three be the constant in the earlier theorem six for the finite horizon T, then for N larger than or equal to N epsilon over three, the policy given there extended arbitrarily from T plus one to infinity is an epsilon Nash equilibrium. And, and this is essentially a result which says that for the POM DP, if you, if you solve the problem uh, with uh, uh, for the uh, finite horizon, then if the horizon is uh, long enough, then it provides an approximate solution to the infinite horizon problem. So that's the uh, so the recap is I have uh, discussed uh, give, I have given you. Uh, the highlights of the uh, existence of approximate Nash equilibria for finite population game problems of the mean field type for both fully observed and partially observed mean field games with discounted regular, which we call risk neutral, as well as risk sensitive cost. And, uh, and as far as extensions go, there are many. The, this was a homogeneous mean field game. The, the, uh, players enter symmetrically, extending to non-homogeneous ones. Average cost mean field games is another one. Mean field games with conditional risk measures uh, is another. These are all non-trivial uh, extensions. And and one uh, recent uh, interest that we have is the and and probably the mean field game. Research will also go in that direction. Is that if the, here I have assumed that all models, the model is known, the players are not learning anything as they apply their policies, and and there is a lot of research on reinforcement learning using machine learning and AI techniques. So what can you do in this context if you have unspecified models, and 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 you want to come up with data-driven sort of learning and and policy execution so thank you